Welcome everyone to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. As a communication coach, trainer, speaker, and author, I am delighted to be your host and excited to bring you insights and ideas to help you solve your communication conundrums. This is the 20th episode of my show, Partner Up with Amy Carroll. If you want to find out more about me or what the show's about, feel free to listen to previous episodes on my website, carolcoaching.com or the voiceamerica.com business channel. And be sure to download the app, or you can even check it out on any of your favorite podcast apps. Now, if you missed last week's show, I interviewed Rindy Bristol, a senior director in the food service industry. Rindy and I talked about the challenge and the payoff of applying multiple partner mindset techniques and the surprising outcomes which resulted. Today, my guest is Dr. George Colreiser. Welcome, George. I'm very happy to be here, Amy. Well, I'm happy to have you on. I, George, I was thinking we met probably 14 or 15 years ago was the first time I suspect, yes? I think so, in Rome. In Rome at the WIN conference, exactly. Correct. Yes, that's right. And our paths have crossed many times since then. So I would like to take a few minutes, George, to indulge the listeners with your background. Okay. Because I think it's going to be very useful for them to hear exactly who it is, is on the sh- who's on the show today. George is an organizational and clinical psychologist, distinguished professor of leadership and organizational behavior at IMD, which is the International Institute for Management Development. And it's a business school located in Lausanne, Switzerland. George is a consultant to many global companies from Cisco to NASA. And he speaks regularly at professional conferences such as the World Business Forum. George's research, teaching, and consulting focus on high-performance leadership, high-performance teamwork, conflict management, change management, stress management, management, and this, my friends, is only some of the topics he covers. And as a police psychologist and hostage negotiator, George has worked in over 100 countries, focusing on aggression management and hostage negotiations. At IMD, George is director of the High Performance Leadership Program, which is an intense six-day program for experienced senior leaders, as well as the advanced High Performance Leadership Program. His research has made significant contributions to understanding the role self-mastery has in helping leaders sustain high performance. We're gonna be revisiting that during our discussion, this this concept of self-mastery. Now, as a media, media commentator on issues related to leadership, conflict, aggression management, and hostage negotiation, George had his own highly acclaimed radio call-in talk show in the U.S. for over 10 years and consulted with the BBC, CNN, ABC, and CBS. Some of the publications where George's work has been featured include the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, The Financial Times, Forbes. He's been a speaker at TEDx Talks, both here in Lausanne, as well as New York. Now, George has written a couple of books. The first one I remember reading, Hostage at the Table, an internationally best-selling book. And the tagline to Hostage at the the Table is how leaders can overcome conflict, influence others, and raise performance. Now, his second book, Care to Dare, is about unleashing astonishing potential through secure-based leadership. We're gonna be talking more about both of those books. Though not only have his books been nominated for and received multiple awards, George has won numerous personal and program awards for his teaching and contribution in the field of high performance. Needless to say, this discussion is going to be chock full of useful content for you, my listeners, to be able to apply in all areas of your life. So let's get started. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Amy. Sure, boy, I, each time I, I think about it, I think, yeah, this is a delight to get someone with such rich knowledge and experience. In fact, George, I have to uh, tell you that I, for years, have been quoting something from your first book, Hostage at the Table, called The Four Sentence Rule. <laughs> now, listeners, this is, uh, I'm going to do a little teach out. George, feel free to correct me if I do it differently than you would. This is about helping people become more concise. And frankly, with video conferencing, it's even more urgent for people to be concise because other people just don't have the bandwidth to focus. 
And so when I'm coaching leaders and they're babbling on and on and on, and I'm like, you know, close to tears and I, I can't, I don't, I don't know what he's saying. I pull out the George four sentence rule principle and I say, okay, I want you to say that to me again in four sentences. And they look at me in horror, like, well, what do you mean four sentences? And I just sit back and wait. I take your time. And they don't even need that much time, George. I am always amazed how quickly they're able to organize their thoughts. Sometimes they do it in four sentences and sometimes they do it in even less. It could even be in one sentence, huh? Yes, exactly. And then they're always astounded that they're able to do it. And I say, go well, now you got to go home and practice that until you can do it the first time. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's about dialogue. This is what really happens in good dialogue. You have to maintain the brain's full attention. And we know the brain starts numbing down after about four sentences. It used to be seven. That's why uh -huh. telephone numbers are generally in seven or eight digits. They uh -huh. found in the 50s when they were distributing phone numbers, short-term memory could only hold seven items. Mm -hmm. And now because of social media and all the technology, we're numbing down. It's actually four sentences to maintain. Wow maximum attention. That's in dialogue. Now in presentations, that's different. So sure. that's important to clarify. Yeah. Yeah. That's all oh, I hadn't realized that, you know, George, when you and I were talking about this interview, we talked, one of the things we agree on among many things is that psychological safety is one of the foundational elements of effective leadership for a healthy work environment. So I'm, my sense is that we let's use that as our red thread around okay. psychological safety. Great. Okay. With that in mind, the thing I'd like you to start us off with is how would you define psychological safety? Well, psychological safety means that you are trustworthy, that you do not pre uh, present a threat to belittle, discount, disrespect, etc. And with that sense, I will not be humiliated. I will be accepted. Then the brain shuts down and opens up. So that's on an individual basis, the, the psychological safety. At a team basis, it's, does that happen in a team? Does that happen in an organization? That you feel you can say things, you can present ideas and not be made fun of, not humiliated. It's that trust which shuts down the brain's need to defend itself. When people are defending, that means they are a psychological hostage and creativity is killed. Wow, that's um, a pretty intense explanation and yet so common sense. Yeah, yeah. And it often doesn't happen. There are many bilateral relationships because of the person effect that people feel different. Because of the what effect? The, the person effect. The person effect is the immediate, and you know this from your, your, your tremendous work, is what presence you present and what impact it has on the other. Much mm -hmm. of it is nonverbal. And sure. why is it we feel defensive sometimes? And sometimes we feel immediate chemistry. It's the person effect. And Got this it. is very important for the leader who may be producing defensiveness in the other person without being aware of it. Yes, unintentionally. In fact, there's a great, uh, I think it was your friend, Daniel Goleman, who was part of this article in Harvard Business Review called Primal Leadership. Prime, Many yeah. years ago, okay? And in one of the beautiful nuggets from that article was the importance of a smile. Yeah. And be, I used to teach smiling as a way to look approachable and friendly and be nice. Oh, no, no, no. What I've learned possibly from that article was, yeah, I think it probably was from that article. If I'm not smiling, or if the, let's say the leader's not smiling, that can get in negatively interpret like, uh oh, something's wrong. Yeah. She's upset. I've done some, you know, my job is at threat. And all of a sudden that employee is no longer thinking about their work. Yeah. They're, they're thinking about literally, you know, professional survival. Yeah. And what happens is it has to be an authentic smile. So yes. you have somebody who's presenting an artificial presence and it comes across as untrustworthy. And Even worse. No. Yeah, or worse. And people can sense when, when someone is dishonest, even when they're lying. Now, sometimes you get so numbed, you stop looking for those signals from the eyes, from the mouth, from the posture, all the things you teach in charismatic theater. And, you know, I would say that 
so it, it is something that people can uh, consciously do. It won't meet, feel horribly, not horribly, it won't feel incredibly authentic for them in the moment. Though if they smile, and what I say, and you probably know this, is smiling from the eyes. And yeah. this is something we can practice with all of yeah. us walking around wearing masks now. You know, you can still look approachable it, it, yeah. and just get the smile from your eyes. And that's all you need to do. Yeah. Well, smiling is a very cultural thing, too. If you look at Northern mm. Europe, for example, Finland, often you see Finnish people or Northern uh, European people. They don't smile that much. Russians, Understandable. Yeah. They live in darkness half of the year. <laughs> Uh, we're going through the, the longest or the shortest day right now uh, in, in this period. And so they have to learn how to smile. And I've had executive leaders who had to practice over and over how to yes. smile until it became authentic. Yes. And they couldn't believe how that affects the bonding and the yes. connection. If we agree, bonding, which we know is true, is the foundation of all connection, is the foundation of all leadership, then we have to be able to use our person effect to help create that bond. Yeah. Many leaders do not do that effectively. And I want to reinforce what you said earlier, that it takes practice to learn a lot of these skills. And during that period of practice, you will probably feel inauthentic, Correct. just like learning any kind of language or sport or any new skill. So it's important that people not judge it immediately. Oh, I don't feel authentic. So therefore I'm not capable of doing it. That's why it's very important for them to understand in their mindset, why it is important. Yes. If they don't have the insight as yeah. to why this is important, then it is even more difficult because it doesn't really have full meaning and purpose. Yeah. If their goal is to lead effectively and to connect is the foundation of that, then they learn that skill. Yeah. So going back to this concept of psychological safety, what would you identify or in your experience when you've worked with people, what are some of the costs and some of the benefits of having it or not having it? Oh my goodness. With psychological safety, when you do have it, people feel relaxed. They're able then to be curious, to express new ideas, brainstorm in a different way, be able to express themselves. They tend to have more fun, far more engagement. With lack of, of safety, people become defensive. It becomes more conflictual. They start arguing. They start being able to territorialize things and tribalize within a team, exclude and include. So it really affects the engagement and the creativity. We know the brain is fundamentally hardwired to look for pain and danger. It's yeah. simple to survive. Yeah. But when you have trust, when you have psychological safety, it shuts that part of the brain down. And through secure bases, if that secure base is the team or the other person, you then start opening up and you see the positive. You see uh, curiosity and beauty. There are many people who are so defensive, they don't see the beauty of life. They don't see the beauty of work. Mm -hmm. They don't see the beauty in other people. They are so focused on the negative. You know, I, I remember hearing a quote from you once. I think this is accurate. Defensiveness reduces our ability to learn. Correct. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Learning is based on a positive state and it's based on a desire to understand, to see something different, connect the dots, find a new idea. Yeah. If you're defensive, you're, you're defending. Yeah. So I have some ways that I teach and, and coach people to become less defensive. What are some of your suggestions or, or ways to support people to number concretely one, be less defensive? One, number one, be curious. Okay. By asking questions. Hmm. So we see many leaders who stop asking questions. They mm -hmm. want to tell people what they think. They want to tell people what they want okay. others to understand. Kill it. No you're curious and you ask questions. So then what you, I, yeah. thanks. What I hear is shifting from the tell mode to the ask mode, the coaching mode. Yeah. There's a great book you've probably heard, The Tao of Coaching, spelled yeah. T-A-O. And yeah. it's a wonderful book I recommend to my clients for you know simplistic coaching style. And it has four, no, at least two pages in the back of very concrete, juicy, powerful questions that they can be asking. Yeah, perfect. And then the second thing is paraphrasing. So when you 
are asking a question and you hear something to prove that you're listening and people love to understand that they're listened to. You yeah. paraphrase. Did I understand this is what you're saying? Did I understand this correct? Right. And there's a very important secret. Learning how to paraphrase sometimes, not often, sometimes inaccurately to see if the other person uh -huh. will say no. Huh. And if they say no, it deepens the engagement. And then you follow on and say, would you help me understand or clarify what I did not understand? Oh it's a hostage gosh. negotiation techniques. We use this in hostage negotiation techniques. You know, Paraphrasing is fundamental to creating yeah. fun. But sometimes to break out of the mindset of just saying yes, 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 you want to get the person to say no. And why? Uh -huh. Because every time we say no, we feel empowered. Wow. Oh my goodness. I'm going to, uh, this is so reassuring because one of the skills I teach people is active listening, which includes active summarizing. And I also teach them how to interrupt in a way that doesn't annoy the person. There's a video on my website. People can check that out. And one of the things that people get really stressed about when I'm teaching is, oh, Amy, I can't do active listening and actually listen at the same time. And I explain, you got to practice in low stress moments when the kids come home from school, whatever the case, until you get, you're, you're then able, eventually over time, able to do both things. And what you've just um, said about the benefit of getting it wrong can actually um, make sure that the person's listening and they get to say no, which empowers them. You've just opened up a whole nother level of the importance of not being perfect and not having to do everything right, that there's a huge benefit in this. Yeah, the whole thing is built around transactions. And one of the things when a person says no, you also can reward that and say, oh, thank you for telling me. Now I understand something different. Yeah. So it, it's a way to build the bond. Uh -huh. Oh, that's brilliant. So, um, you know, when we, we're looking at the world where in it these days, and I think of the acronym VOCA, uh, VUCA, and if listeners don't know what VUCA stands for, it stands for volat volatile, volatile, how do we volatility. say it? Volatility, thank you very much. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And when I think about that, I, I want to ask you, how can we build psychological safety in this world that we're living in that feels full of danger, fear, and uncertainty? Well, first of all, accept the reality. Mm -hmm. The world is filled with danger. It is filled with uncertainty. This yeah. whole pandemic episode of this virus is a real danger, and many people feel that. And the consequences for our work life, personal life, has brought so many fundamental losses and changes. Yeah. So what we have to do is find secure bases. Mm -hmm. And the secret is how to be a secure base in the middle of paranoia, in the middle of, of turmoil, in the middle of danger. So leaders have to be that secure base. And they have to be a secure base first in themselves mm -hmm. in order to be able to see, be a secure base for others. And then you start building off of that and you build that that uh, foundation on a team. And it often starts in a family. A family that is filled with too much anxiety is going to affect everyone. It actually can be traumatic. Yeah. And the parents have to be able to create that psychological safety. And they have to have that inside themselves to be able to create that island of safety, the island of calmness, and being able to do that in a crisis. So let's talk about that in some concrete detail. I, I'm going to quote you again, something else I remember you saying, stress is the strongest inhibitor to brain plasticity. So we as leaders m are required to be able to manage our mindset, to have mastery over our thinking and our behaviors in order to create that secure base, in order to create that psychological safety. Is that accurate? Uh, no, it's, it, it is stress can be a destroyer of brain plasticity. Stress, positive stress, you are stressed, can actually produce oh, okay. uh, 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 neurons. It's it. the negative stress that then kills the ability to see the beauty, the opportunities, what's around. So stress can be positive or negative. 
what is a stressor to one person will not be a stressor to another person. And that can actually then take away the psychological safety because you activate the fight flight reflex. Yeah. When the fight flight reflex is not activated by um, the stressor, then it becomes positive. It's I when see. the fight flight reflex is activated, then that the impulse to run or to flee. And Sully Sullenberger is a good example. Yes. He's landing this plane in then on the Hudson River. And when you hear him talk about his experience there, he was calm. He knew what to do. He was able to manage that. And that was a positive impact on his brain. Now, if he panics, if he goes into a negative state, then he starts destroying brain cells. That's why we know that people who have too much anxiety, stop it. It just kills brain cells. Worrying too much too often. People who are filled with anger. People who are filled with regret. People who are filled with fear or sadness. You see, you have to get into these positive emotional states and stop being a hostage to yourself and those negative states. Okay, so those negative states, when I'm listening to you listed off, I can imagine listeners might be feeling overwhelmed. And one of the things that people say to me, well, Amy, this is just how I am. I'm just emotional, or I'm just, you know, fill in the nationality, or, you know, um, this is how my family has been. And that may be true. So like what you said about the world as it is, except the current state now, except that you are perhaps currently in that a place in your life where you are someone who is explosive and that behavior is completely coachable and can be rewired. So one of the things, I don't know, have you ever heard of this term, George, called sipping the soup? No. Okay. I heard about this maybe through a podcast or something a couple of months ago. And it's a technique that uh, I, um, I encourage people to use in the moment when they're feeling under attack. So like that defensiveness, what do you do when you're feeling defensive? And first thing is keep your mouth shut, meaning don't say anything yet in this moment. And as let's imagine the other person's yelling at you, you do what you would normally do as if you're eating soup. So what we do is we take a spoonful of soup and we take in a deep breath in order to blow on the spoon and then we slowly exhale. So the idea is when someone is yelling at us, we symbolically uh, um, sip the soup by taking in a deep breath and then slowly, calmly exhaling. And just that alone can start to rewire the brain to uh, trigger the parasympathetic nervous system to, um, you know, that amygdala hijacking that is happening in our brains to, to interrupt that process. So, so that's something that, I encourage. That sounds good, but there's a simpler technique. Okay, good, tell that's us. That's the question. When you are under stress, when you're in high anxiety, you ask the question, Beautiful. you engage the bonding and bonding will be the key to reducing. So when you're doing the, uh, the, the eating the soup, <laughs> what you're basically do is bonding to yourself, your inner state. Yes. And you might and, have to do that first before you can formulate well, a question. I think you can do, you can just do a question. Yeah. You, can do, you know, as a hostage negotiator, I've been attacked. I've been held hostage four times myself, humiliated, all kinds of things. You cannot be a hostage to that. So you don't even have time to think about the soup. You have to be able to respond immediately. And the simplest way is ask a question, get into a dialogue. Somebody's mm -hmm. screaming at you and you say, what is it you exactly want me to understand? Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that I've done to make you so angry? Mm -hmm. So you immediately start bonding and that will tend to calm. And the examples you just gave are beautiful, very simple questions. It's not like you have to, now I can see why it's possible to do it in the, in the moment, a heated moment, because you're asking sort of um, simple questions. You're putting it back on them. It's obvious. Yeah. Why are you angry? Yeah. Why are you screaming at me? Yeah. What did you hope to accomplish by threatening me with a gun? Yeah. And you, you engage them you activate their frontal uh, lobes to think about what the answer is. Yeah. And I would, I would add to that three words um, that's work like a question, which is tell me more. 
Well, yeah, but that's an order. Oh, when I those, see. Yeah, when you say, tell me more, if you've got somebody who is allergic to authority, okay. they're, gonna, they're, they're maybe going to explode. Wow. So, uh, ask a pure question. Will you tell me more? Just nice. adding the word will. Okay. Giving choice. You see, yep. hostage negotiators have learned one basic thing. Hostage takers come out when they have a choice. You don't tell a hostage taker to come out. You find yep. a way after understanding their grievance, how they can choose to come out. So we often use a kind of command and control language yeah. that uh, will, will prov provoke rebellion in some people or oh, over submission. Very, so very simple, helpful. Simple word will. Yeah, my gosh, it's amazing. And it, it really shifts things. George, we're going to take a quick break now. And when we come back, I want to hear if you'd be willing to share more of your experience as a hostage negotiator. Sure. Listeners, you can connect with George and find out more about him on his website. And it's georgecolreser.com. And that's George. And let me spell the last name. K-O-H-L-R-I-E-S-E-R. And you are listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Be back shortly. Welcome back to Partner Up with Amy Carroll. My guest today is Dr. George Colreiser, an organizational and clinical psychologist, professor, and former hostage negotiator. Before the break, we were just starting to talk about that experience. So George, let's hear more from you. What have you learned about your, from your experience as a hostage negotiator that you'd like to share with listeners? Well, I have been engaged in over a hundred negotiations for hostages, and I've been held hostage four times myself in the role of doing domestic violence with the police, because I would go into the homes as a mediator and then things would get out of control, et cetera. So what I've learned is basically uh, the importance of bonding, how you connect and how do you connect to someone you don't like, someone who is hostile to you, someone who appears to be an enemy, and you're able to do that by having a common goal. Then secondly, is to engage in understanding their motivation. Happy people don't take hostages. What does that mean? It means loss, grievance is always going to be behind it. So the first thing you have to do is understand that as crazy as it may be, as psychotic as it may be. It's not about saying, I agree with that. It's about creating acceptance. And then thirdly, concession making. And based on that concession making, those three steps, connecting, hearing the grievance, and concession making, we get about a 95% success rate as measured by the FBI in Interpol here in Europe. Now, that's amazing. And it's yeah. self-leading, self-mastery, as we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. leading others, getting the mindset to change and come out knowing they're fully probably going to go to prison, giving up their we weapons. The other 5% are people who want to commit suicide by police generally. And it, and it starts with not knowing what they want. They're mm -hmm. in a despair. And the first thing is to know what they want and then get them connected to that. Now, what I mostly learned is that the techniques that we use to get that 95% success rate can be used with psychological hostage taking. Now, what okay. is a psychological hostage? Well, it's someone who is a hostage to a boss, a colleague, a spouse. You name the opportunities to be a hostage to them. COVID. COVID. There are many people who are a hostage to this whole COVID virus. Yeah. And mostly to yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you're filled with anger, regret, shame, uh, uh, all kinds of internal states, lack of confidence, you are a hostage to yourself. The same techniques we use in physical hostage taking can be used in psychological hostage taking. Nobody should ever be a hostage to another person or to themselves. And many people don't realize that they are a hostage. And how do you know when you feel powerless? And what is underlying that is some kind of fear and below that will be some kind of loss, grief. Okay, so let's say I am feeling powerless uh -huh. Um, then the next thing to explore is what is the fear? What is the loss? What is the grief? 
to get to that? Understand what it is that you most want. Why Mm -hmm. are you feeling helpless? Mm -hmm. What are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. And what's the loss behind that? We are afraid because some loss provokes it. If you're afraid to put the conflict on the table and engage someone in a difficult conversation, it may be the loss that maybe something negative happens. You break the relationship. So you come back and to do that, you have to have secure bases. You cannot do this alone. So you have to have a network of secure bases, which brings us right back to psychological safety. Yeah. So you have to have someone who is there to trust And then that gets internalized into an internal secure base, but we always need external secure bases. So I want to move into your second book, Care Today or Shortly, though I want to um, shout out to the listeners to definitely read your first book, Hostage at the Table, because it is full of all sorts of fascinating examples that you have gone through probably, you know, many of these hundred or so cases that you've had. Um, And it's just, I remember one about a grandmother who was, you know, she had her wits about her and she, how she handled a situation that was potentially so dangerous. So I encourage readers to pick up that book. Thank you. So um, in Care to Dare, one of the things I've picked up is you talk about the importance to have respectful conflict to dare to speak your truth. And I think this is, when I work with people, George, they struggle so much of being able to have those difficult, delicate conversations. And I mean, one time I worked with a guy who um, was afraid to tell his, his board members that he was getting a divorce. And he just couldn't for a moment imagine making himself that vulnerable. And so we role played it, it probably took about 45 minutes And then once we did it, I said, okay, so whether or not you decide to actually do it, how are you feeling about it now? He's like, yeah, I can totally do it now. So once people understand the how to package a message, that fear often melts away. And I think that one of the things, you know, you have this great expression, I think it's in Hostage at the Table, put the fish on the table, dare to have the difficult, delicate conversations. And that is it accurate to um, what I recall is essentially you're saying men generally need to find more empathy and women tend to be able to uh, need to deal more with direct conflict? Uh, yes, that, that's correct. Men have to be learn how to bond. Many men do okay. not know how to bond. Mm. They know how to attach but not bond. Women have to stand their ground. They have to learn how to deal with conflicts and push back mm-hmm. and press their differences of opinion. And it, and actually, Amy, it starts in the mindset because we have to view conflict as positive. Most people are saying to themselves, I don't like conflict. That's a very destructive message. Conflict is good. Yes. Why? Because conflict is based on difference. We need difference. But yeah. it's when the emotionality and the tension and the disagreement and polarization escalates, but that will only happen where the bonding is broken or does not exist. You see, where you create that bond, you can have a huge difference and there won't be a true conflict. Mm -hmm. Or you can have a small difference, break the bond, and you will have a huge conflict. Mm -hmm. So for these difficult conversations, they have to start by thinking about uh, the positive nature. And conflict is when you resolve it, an attempt to form the bond. So what you did with this gentleman, you became a secure base. You became a teacher. Right. And many people grew up in families or went through schools. They don't know how to deal with difficult conversations. Right. Or they sugarcoat it or they avoid it. They do anything but get the fish under the table. And I use that metaphor because if every conflict was like a fish and they were all under you the You deal table, with it. <laughs> It would be very smelly. Oh, that would, would be, be right. If they, yeah, but they don't get it on the table, yes. They have to get it on the table, but it's not about <laughs> slapping someone in the face with the face, right. it's about respect. Yes, yeah. And um, I, I'm i in love with Brene Brown. And you know, one of the things that she talks about is to be able to say the difficult things in a kind and caring way. 
And I think that's, a, and we have to be able to manage our internal state to be calm enough to be able to say it in this controlled, slow, gentle manner to um, be able to be present enough to know if you're feeling stressed to be able to pause and say, you know, tell, um, would you tell me more? And to ask those questions of curiosity. Well, sometimes it, it, there's exceptions. So that okay. you know this from charismatic theater, intensity. You sometimes have to match the conflict. Oh, good point. A little bit lower to lower it. Yes. And if you come in too low, it provokes. Yes. It looks like you don't care. Yes. So you have to be able to come in. The secret is to match, not overemphasize, but to help reduce the conflict. So you have to learn how to fight. Good conflict management is, a, is about fighting, except you follow certain rules. Yeah. And it's not like street fighting, which no. for many people it is. So if you grew up in a family where you have brothers and sisters, that's the best training in the world. Yeah. Right, to deal yeah. with I have Get three the of parents each. Deal with that. <laughs> And secondly, if you go to school and you go through the process of being able to push back against authority figures, because the fundamental fear of conflict has to do with how do we imagine authority and we give power to somebody that we won't be honest with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you're talking about energy. And one of the things I teach is people showing up in positive energy, um, and that energy, because it's contagious, it's, it works like a magnet. So what you were saying is, if that person is up here with intensity, you want to be right below them so that the, the con there's a connection. And then when they start to come down to match your energy, you can go one level lower. I think it's the, an approach that uh, police officers use to in order to de-escalate people. De-escalating. However... This takes training and learning because sometimes you don't want to match. You want to be very calm. Okay. And that brings the person down. You have to know who you're dealing with mm -hmm. and it becomes a kind of ex exploration. So I might even escalate hmm. conflict a little bit to get the other person's attention. Uh -huh. uh, and, and I was once held hostage with the scissors and I was with the scissors at my throat, having to be able to talk this person down. Now I used a very calm voice. I used my radio voice. <laughs> and I once had uh, uh, someone with a gun and they shot the gun. I heard the bullet go right by my ear. Now, here was the point. They both could have killed me, but they right. didn't. My mindset had to be focused on that person. And then I used my voice, my whole person effect to get them to express what it is that they wanted. And then we negotiated from there. Mm, that's fascinating. But see, you have to be able to see somebody who has a scissors that you throw it is actually a positive thing. Someone who has a gun that's going to shoot it, unless they put the bullet in your body and you're still, a, you're killed, then it's over. But if you're still alive, they want something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that takes a very powerful self-mastery yes. or leading the self. Yeah, yeah. And, and a, a much less threatening, tell me if this is true, <laughs> a much less threatening example of that is when you're negotiating and someone says no, um, that that's not necessarily bad news. It oh, means they're still that, engaged. That means that, that, that's positive. You know where they stand. Let's keep talking. No means yeah. let's keep talking. Mm -hmm. Don't take it as rejection. Mm -hmm. And you see many people take what they disagree with, what they don't like as a rejection. And so they activate the amygdala hijack right. and they back off and, or they become overreactive. And, and some people play games around trying to escalate other people's emotions because the sure. state the most fundamental part of all negotiation is emotion. If I can trigger you into an emotion, I can take control over you. Uh huh. And that's one of the things when I work with co coaches, I hear them say, she made me so mad or he, and I'm like, okay, I have some really bad news for you. <laughs> and I make sure they're sitting far enough away that they, you know, they can't reach me. And I say, um, okay, so here's the news flash. No one can make us feel anything. It's happening in such an instantaneous moment. I get that it doesn't seem like you have any control over it. 
and you do. So that's when I, after I deliver that bad news and they're sort of quiet for a while and they're pensive and like, hmm, yeah, technically that's true because I can walk into a room full of people and I can make one statement and some people will get really reactive and some people won't. Well, that's not me or what I've said, it's people's choices. Um, so that's one of the things that I like to share with people to empower them. Like, oh yeah, I always have a choice no matter how it feels inside. Great. So I want to move on to um, some burning questions that I think that will be important for listeners. And I'm going to throw both of them to you at the same time and, and, and feel free to address them how you like. The first question I have for you, George, is what are the leadership demands going to be after COVID? Well, first of all, it's, it's going to be, oh, you were going to ask the second question right the away. The second one um, is um, around collective grief. How do we overcome this collective grief yeah. that COVID has brought to us? Yeah. Well, on that first question, the number one thing is going to be strategy, the artificial intelligence, and the digitalization world. Now, that's a whole separate category because that's been evolving. COVID has pushed us into that like we never thought it would. Then on the psychological level, the leaders are going to have to be able to deal with the divisiveness in society, the mm -hmm. tribalization, the self-centeredness, the idea of me comes first. Um, it, it's, not, it's helping people understand they're citizens of the world, not of just one country. Mm -hmm. We are in this together. And the pandemic has proven it does not respect borders. Yeah. And we be, have to be able to get leaders to uh, overcome that divisiveness and learn how to bond with people who have a difference of opinion. I love when people have a difference of opinion. And then I think we have to be able to engage in that dialogue. Then the second thing is leaders are going to be at a great demand to build trust. People don't trust the leaders. And we know now some research out of the states point to 80% of people do not trust their boss. Now that wow. includes public employees. So if you're a private organization or a for-profit organization, that's a real tragedy if it's that high. Yeah. So what we have to do is deal with this idea of fake news, this idea of alternate facts. That's been one of the most damaging things that have happened to the mindset of people. That if you don't like what's on the news, you call it fake news. Yeah. Or if you don't like the reality, you say it's alternate facts. Well, there is no such thing as alternate facts. However, there is different perceptions of facts. Yeah. In the courtroom, people can have two perceptions of what happened in an accident. But what's the way out of that? What's the way out of that? Dialogue. One simple, one, no, evidence. Oh. It's what is the evidence? Mm -hmm. And how do we understand and look at the evidence behind something? And sometimes that's ambiguous also, but we have to be able to then come to some public consensus of reality. But leaders have to be able to do that once they engage in dialogue. That's what okay. the role of dialogue is. So, and, and the big challenge will be, um, how do we bring people together? And uh, the whole movement away from command and control leadership. The world of command and control leadership is dying. Some oh, many leaders God. don't know that. They don't know that. We have to think collaboration, cooperation. Yeah. And I live here in Switzerland, as you do. Yeah. And all too often I hear that the leaders do not trust their people to work at home. They have mm -hmm. the mindset, if you're working at home, you're probably going to take advantage of that. And you're going to be doing all other kinds of things besides working. The evidence points in a complete different direction than that. And then behind that is going to be the universal grief. We are in a world of grief now, no question. And for some people, they've turned it into a learning. So it doesn't feel like a grief. The pandemic is a very, very significant event. And we've just look at all the losses from wearing yeah. masks, not being able to go to family at the holidays, et cetera. And then we're going to have to look at all the hidden griefs that are gonna follow. Many people like working at home, about 30%. Another 30% to 40% wanna come back to the office. They miss those meetings, they, the coffee machine chatter and so forth. And then the other percent is going to be 
what the organization needs. So it's going to take dialogue, negotiation to find a new way of how we're going to work at home. Homeworking has been found to be far more effective than what we ever thought was going to be possible. Amazing. And the pandemic has moved it forward. Zoom has created, or whatever platform you use, the, in, the ability to have meetings across um, all kinds of territory and time zones, et cetera. But the brain has been altered by the lack of social contact. Never forget, yeah. Zoom call is different than being able to talk to someone in person where you see directly the nonverbals, you experience their physical presence, et cetera, in a different way than we do on Zoom. So all this digital work will, will not be uh, fully substituted for in-face working. And again, we have to come back to one idea and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop, is yeah. that we are emotional beings before thinking beings. Mm -hmm. Most people would like to think we are rational beings who happen to think. It's the other way around. We are uh, emotional beings who happen to think. And that's why loss and grief, hidden loss and grief in organization is so dramatically important. And I would add to that, I think that, and you may have said this earlier though, I think it's important for a leader to accept the reality of um, that grief does exist at different points and different levels and different degrees for their teams. And that they, as a leader are responsible for addressing it. Would yeah, you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. They have to be able to recognize the signals in individuals, in teams, and look at failures, look at mergers and acquisitions, look at the hundreds and hundreds of examples of losses that are affecting people that make their way to a grievance committee, but they are grief that's behind that. Yes. And we know there are extreme uh, consequences and there are less extreme consequences. All are significant. Yeah, something you said also a few minutes ago I wanted to address is, you know, we're emotional beings that the virtual is not going to replace the face to face. And yet one of the things that as a result of COVID that has been born through into um, that has come as a gift from or in the work that I do is I'm helping people to sh um, teach them how they can connect more uh, faster and more profoundly um, over virtual, profound is, is too strong a word, uh, more um, to connect um, more quickly and more playfully uh, to as a way to be a somewhat of a substitute for the the into the face-to-face -face engagement we we're all missing so much. Yeah. Um, so how do we bond over Zoom or over one of the digital platforms? Playful. And we have to be able to do that. Well, there's many ways that, that yes. you can do that. And, and the fact is, it is challenging to create that kind of bonding. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the things I will encourage people to do is to think about um, learning. If you've never heard about improv, if you've thought about taking an improv class, you know, there's loads of options now that people can learn this stuff virtually in, with sessions um, being offered globally. And what's beautiful about it is that it teaches people to build that rapport, to build the potentially leading to bonding. And, and when people are willing to take risks with each other, it builds that secure base as well, I suspect. Absolutely. So George, we are just coming to the end of our discussion. And before- So quickly. <laughs> I know, right? I want to ask you, what is a- a call for action. Well, actually, I'm going to call, give one of my call for actions, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. So listeners, you are absolutely going to want to check out George's website. It is chock full of resources. Uh, there's an example of an inspiring conversation that George had with Dr. Edith Ager. Did I say her name right? Ager? She's a 92-year-old Holocaust survivor, and it's just such a beautiful, touching conversation. So you can check that out at georgecolereser.com. Okay, George, over to you. What's your call for action? My call for action is for everybody who is listening to examine if they are feeling like a hostage and to know if that is happening either externally or internally. 
So know what is controlling you. Secondly, find the beauty of life. Make a choice to see how you can change how you feel. This is Edith's core message. No matter how terrible, how traumatic it was, and she lost her parents in Auschwitz, and she was there as a teenager. Took her 25 years to put words to that pain. But she says that experience, that trauma was the most important event to help her learn what the joy of life is. We don't need to be a victim. Yes. And the third thing is to really appreciate the social bonds around you. That if COVID has taught us anything, it's taught us that when something is missing, we appreciate it a lot more. Yes. And many people do not really appreciate all that they have. They don't live with gratitude. They live with a sense, I want more. Yeah. And how to live with full joy and experience that no matter what has happened to you. Yeah. That's my call to action. Beautiful. And I would add to that, that around checking if you're a psychological hostage, you may want to read Nelson Mandela's book, Playing the Enemy. It's a great example of how he manages his mindset, set, he stays partner, and he's able to do that with all these people who are not exactly his friends. Now, I want to encourage listeners to send me your communication conundrums, clashes, challenges, mishaps, blunders, and successes. You can do that via email or social media, and I will read and discuss them on future shows and make suggestions. My email is amy at carolcoaching.com. That's two R's and two L's. Be sure to tune in next week when I'm going to be talking with a lovely person, a friend, a colleague, and an inspiring improviser. Feel free to connect with me on my social media channels, which is Amy Carol Coaching. And if you're ready to take your superhero partner powers into the next decade, join me for my online leadership presence course. You can check out the details on my website, carolcoaching.com. George, thank you. It's been a wonderful conversation. It's my pleasure. Thank you, uh, Amy. And I wish you all the very best and all your listeners. Thank you. And listeners, thank you. You've been listening to Partner Up with Amy Carroll on the Voice America Business Channel. Happy partnering, everyone. <laughs>